Welcome to Research Matters with Unda and Kuda, an online show that is all about communicating the research taking place at NAS in efforts to promote the university's research agenda and the impact thereof. There we go. That's right. A very warm welcome to this week's edition of Research Matters with Unda and Koda right here on Nast FM. But today we're switching things up a little bit, yeah? So my girl Unda is not feeling well. She's down and under. The bug got her. The flu bug got her. But luckily in the house today we've got Miss K who will be taking this flight with me, the co-host for today, Miss Kay. Welcome, and thank you for stepping in. Thank right? you for having me. I'm happy to be here. You know, when uh, you have to switch things up a little bit, you're like so used to having things in a certain format, mm -hmm. but we got to come up with plan B, Z. so get well soon to Unda. Yeah, <laughs> we miss you. All right. Um, in any case, um, this is Research Matters. I'm happy to be here. Um, definitely the first for me. We do have a guest in studio. Um, maybe I'll let you introduce yourself. Oh, thanks very much. Nice to be here. Um, I'm Morgan Hobflush. I am the director of the Biodiversity Research Center and uh, wildlife and environment is my game. Okay, now when you speak about wildlife management, natural resources management, what exactly are we talking about? Why does this matter? Well, the reason it matters is if you look at the country and you look at our rural areas, um, almost half of the country is, is um, inundated or covered with wildlife. So people are living with, uh, with wildlife outside of national parks. And um, we always think that we go to Itosha um, or to Babwata and we can see animals there and then we go back home. But there are a lot of communities that are living day to day among wildlife, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. Okay, that is very interesting. If I can take you back just a little bit, you know, I think we dived right into it, which is yeah. perfect. How did you find yourself in this field? Did you always know what you wanted to do? So I don't quite know how it happened, but um, I have always been interested in nature and in wildlife. Um, I discovered, funny enough, some notes of myself when I was eight years old, where I was observing birds and writing in a oh, notebook. Wow about these birds in my garden that I was feeding. Um, so it's always been in me. But what's, what's really important, and I think for um, NUST students or for young people all over the country, is not everybody has a love for nature, but they can be shown and there can be a an, an love for nature can be instilled in them. And we often see that through our students um, when they come in and they start to appreciate nature. Uh, so it's it's our job really as well to introduce our young students to nature, not just our students, but school children around the country as well. We take them out and um, you you need to really understand it um, or be shown what's wonderful about nature and wildlife. Um, and then the bug often bites. Absolutely. I personally am a lover of nature, but not the wild, more of a domestic setting, farm setting, the safe stuff, the, safe stuff, <laughs> the things that I know. But absolutely. Talk to us about your focus on multiple land use systems and the movement of wildlife between different land uses, as well as what are some of the key findings in terms of what you've discovered? Um, just before I go into that, you say you don't like the wild wild. Um, mm -mm. You like the safe wild yes, on the farm. Yes, yes. But the wild wild can be can be safe as well, right? So, because um, I always tell my students, if a lion is chasing you, it's only the slowest in the group that needs to be worried. The rest of us are all safe. <laughs> <laughs> that's a valid point. That's, that's true. Okay, so getting serious about my, my research. As a scientist, we always like to ask questions. And in my industry, in wildlife, people can often think it's a, it's a luxury. People are hungry. Um, people are struggling out there. Why must they... Um, love wild animals or why do we mm -hmm. do we look at them but actually they are an asset they are a potential revenue generator as any other resource in the country is and if we look at what you were saying now about multiple land uses for example let's go to Kunene there is Itosha National Park which is our prime national park yeah. millions of visitors go there generates income for the country uh, bordering that we have cattle farmers, 
but we have tourism organizations mm-hmm. as well, private landowners that have tourism that uh, takes advantage of the wildlife next to the national park. Then we have resettlement farms where people are really struggling to make a living and communal areas. And some of them have taken advantage of having these wild animals around and others haven't. So what we're trying to do is really understand how do people and wildlife interact in these different land use settings and what decisions are they making that can either turn a wild animal into an asset, Mm -hmm. which can provide you revenue for your community, or a total liability where it's threatening your livelihood. So if we take, for example, a a lion in Itosha National Park, if that lion exits the national park and it goes into an area where there's tourism, that lion becomes even more of an asset and becomes a direct asset to communities who have uh, joint ventures with lodges, for example, that can have tourists come out. Um, even occasional trophy hunting that, that people have generates a lot of money. If that lion goes just a few kilometers in a different direction and goes onto a cattle farm, it's immediately a cost and a threat. So how can the same asset be an income generator and a threat? So we want to understand that um, and also help the communities to say, right, so how can we change things up that you can actually benefit from having wildlife around? That's actually a really valid point, which actually uh, made me think about a documentary I watched not so long ago, you know, really about making the community understand as to what value these animals can have beyond yes, be it, it being a threat, but also just making sure that you know, uh, things are clearly defined or clearly managed, so to put it. we In this space, it's an asset. In this space, it's a liability. But how do we live together in harmony somehow, right? Uh, exactly right. But what I like to tell my students um, that are doing the research out there in the field, and that's something that you said, but many others say as well, mm-hmm. we want to make people understand. Actually, there are people out there they are the ones that really understand it and make it happen. They have the knowledge that are living in these communities. And what we try to do is get that information from them and then share it with the communities or have those people share it with the communities about what they can do. And, and it all fits into the national strategy. Um, if you look at rhino conservation, for example, um, we know there's a lot of focus on rhinos Mm. in Namibia and the threats and the poaching that's Mm. happening and we can't let rhinos go extinct because it will be a national reputational um, damage that we cause our country but on the other hand you have to look at how people benefit as well. Conservation is actually not about wildlife, it's about people. So we always think it's only about the wild animals. We use the wild animals as a proxy as well. So we are following over 100 animals that have satellite trackers on them around this multiple land use area, particularly in the Itosha environment, because how they react uh, tells us how the land is managed as well and how the people are responding or um, utilizing wildlife. Okay, hmm. now I think that's a lot to digest. And whilst we're digesting uh, that, I think Miss Kay is going to take us into a musical break. Then right after, we're going to talk about, dig deeper into the research, talk about your publications and so forth and the work that you're doing with students. But for now, I'll hand it over to Miss Kay. Absolutely. This is a request from uh, Morgan himself. Um, I don't know what the song is about, but I think it's right um, on theme. These are the sounds of uh, Guns and Roses, Jungle. Guns and Roses in that track, it says, Welcome to the Jungle, right? Of course, you're still listening to Nast FM, and we are still on Research Matters with Unda and Kuda. Miss Kay, this time, keeping you guys company. But let's quickly listen. Uh, talk, tell me about the song. What is the song? Miss Kay can't make it. I can't. She's <laughs> done. Tell me about the song. Where does it come from? Well, if you ever go to our little research center, um, which is on Jan Albrecht Street, just outside the small gate coming from the main campus, 
Um, our students sometimes say welcome to the jungle if people come in there because there's, uh, you know, we've we've had snakes there. We've got um, a lot of equipment that we use to catch animals and things there and our, that our research students are onto and microscopes and all that. So um, it can be an interesting place to visit sometimes. Are there uh, any snakes right now? Not that, that I know of. Oh, okay. So but, t- but but I do recall there was a time some years back. Correct me if I'm wrong. Where you had snakes in the class or something of that sort. What was that about, and why? 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 So if you think about our students, um, nature conservation students, for example, and we're talking about conflict, um, snakes is one of the real threats that we have in mm. rural areas. And there are calls that go out to Minister of Environment and Tourism rangers and say there's a snake in the school or in the police station, mm. whatever, can you come fetch it? So, you know, we train the students um, on wildlife and environment. So these are one of the things they have to do. So we did training courses with some of the experts um, in handling snakes safely, removing them from so different you did this places. In class, I really yes, um, we, 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 <laughs> I we love the way you're saying it's so comfortable. We it's did normal. it in class. We we had a nice sort of 2.4 meter black mamba that <laughs> the guys were <laughs> were dealing with. Um, so we did it there, and then we did a short course at the hotel school. And I think I'm still banned from the hotel school after that. Actually, <laughs> um, Liesl. <laughs> uh, um, recently, Yunam had um, a, a visitor in the administrative block. Can you tell me how would you have handled that situation? Because I was like. I think you guys are being mean to the animal. It's not going to do anything. How oh, would you, you have mean, had... You mean when the kudu was... Yes. Like, uh, the the yeah. kudu in the admin building. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it can be quite dangerous. Oh, um, exactly. That sort of thing. For two reasons. Um, one, if... And that happens occasionally that animals come into town. Um, and if they're going into buildings, there's a possibility that they might have rabies because um, rabies affects the brain. Oh. They lose their um, fear of, of humans. So that's the first thing you need to consider that might have rabies. Um, okay. So if that animal bites you, you get rabies, you die. There's no cure for rabies. So um, you need to be really careful with that. But you can assess it. Um, other than that, um, you know, they would. you can tranquilize and immobilize mm-hmm. the animal quite quite easily. Uh, I'm not sure what they did, whether they actually destroyed the animal in the end. Probably the safest with an animal coming into into the the city, unfortunately. Okay, now when we speak about research, you cannot talk about research and not talk about publications. Tell us some of your the work that you've been involved in. What do you like writing about? So that's a key point, I think, that we always stress with our students as well. If you're doing research, if it's not published, it doesn't exist. Um, in the scientific community. So um, I think we try to strike a little bit of a balance between proper scientific writing, um, which goes into the scientific community and generates knowledge, um, and then popular writing. So things to get into magazines or into um, the newspapers, we try to do that quite regularly for general awareness. Um, but there's a very active environmental scientific international community. And um, a lot of our students, if they do a master's or a PhD, they're actually required to publish their work, their research. Um, There was a recent publication of one of our master's students who looked at uh, giraffe and the possibility of taking giraffe back to Angola. They went extinct there a few years ago. Um, and he did a very nice scientific publication in the um, African Journal of Wildlife Research, uh, but then also a, public, a, a popular article in a magazine called Conservation, mm. um, which is available in supermarkets and, uh, and bookstores. But I, I really enjoy um, writing small bits about um, research methodologies, but also about this wildlife movement, um, human wildlife conflict issue. So it's, um, and it's always with students. Um, I don't just do my little research in the corner. We Mm. always have masters and PhD students with us Mm -hmm. um, that are doing that. And if you look at our publications, for um, 2022 and 2023, I think we're going on 24 um, scientific publications, and every single one of them 
includes students. But how has that been working with students, postgraduate students and researchers? Well, we have the Masters and PhD by Research program. Um, actually, we have various programs throughout the university where postgraduates do research. And what makes our Biodiversity Research Center unique is that we don't only take biologists and conservation students. Um, I have an engineering student, a mechanical engineering student. Oh, we wow. supervise computer science students, uh, geospatial science s- students as well, because conservation is so cross-cutting. Mm. Um, and it's a very difficult step for students sometimes to mm-hmm. do a publication. And the international peer review scientific system is very ruthless. Oh. Um, so, yes. <laughs> um, you know, even, even myself, um, probably 30% of the papers I submit are rejected. Um, and it's the That's way it works. <laughs> but I like that. I like that uh, bit of being candid to say, you look, as much as, yes, I'm an established um, academic, there are moments, you know, you get that sting a bit and stuff is rejected. Can oh. you tell us about that and, and how your feelings? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, you, know, you get some of these real big international journals where you submit something and, and you get the five minutes. Thanks, thanks very much for trying. <laughs> uh, this is not worth the paper it's written on. Um, <laughs> oh, no. But um, so, so generally the whole community, so we peer review. Mm-hmm. So, th- and the role of peer review is really to make sure that science that's published is top class. So, when I get something to peer review, you immediately go into, I'm going to try my best to find something wrong with this. Mm-hmm. It's not like yes. a student, ah, they tried their best, this and that. It really is only the top, um, the top science that gets into scientific journals. And I like that a lot because that's cutthroat stuff. And at the end of the day, that is the content that's going to make an impact out there. So one must realize, uh, if I can put it very simply, it's strictly business. <laughs> you know, you do need to put out uh, material publications that really have an impact. And it's got nothing to do with the ego, right? Correct. And they call it double blind peer review. So you don't kn- know who's reviewing your work but the reviewers don't know who you are mm-hmm. either so it's all it's called double blind so it's all anonymous um so that someone with a really big reputation uh, isn't biased say oh th- this guy's got a got um, a really good reputation so his work must be good no it's all uh, double blind and for students the value of having a publication behind their names is almost equivalent to having a master's degree certificate. Mm. It really gives you um, stature as a scientist if your stuff is published. I like that. And, you know, if I can just single out two points that you raised, and I think I really noteworthy, to I like the fact that you mentioned that you take a multidisciplinary approach with your students. So it's not only students that are strictly mm-hmm. in the biodiversity space, but it's also computer science, it's also engineering, and I think that is definitely highly commendable. And also something that speaks dear to my heart is the whole science communication bit, to understand that you need to write beyond the journals, you need to be in the magazines, you need to be online, you need to be in these other conversations. So kudos to you for that. All right. Now that uh, it's all done and dusted, tell us what, as a as a researcher, what would you, what difference would you like to see in society with regard to your focus? Say twenty years, if I can just add. Yeah. Say twenty years years from from now, now, right? And you look back and you say, "I was a part of that." What would you want to be remembered for? That's a A difficult. That's (laughs) that's a difficult question. You know, I think if you've got convictions around the value of wildlife and biodiversity, first of all, just altruistically, because it's beautiful and it's peaceful, but also that people living with it don't always see it the same way, but that we can start, if society can start seeing um, wildlife and nature as an asset, uh, for their livelihoods, and not only something to fight off their farms, uh, you know, keep away. Um, I think it would it would make Namibia such an example for the world. We already are. We're already getting there, but um, of how you can how people can really live with wildlife. There are nearly well, there are eight billion of us in the world. Um, so 
to enable us to live with wildlife, I think. Um, and also, to uh, the other thing is about students. If I sit back in 20 years' time and I'm being bossed around by my students who are in high positions, I will be so, so satisfied oh, wow. with, what, with what I've done. And the next Minister of Environment is coming out of our centre. Watch it. Yes. <laughs> we like that. We're here for it. But with that said, we've come to the end of today's episode of Research Matters with Unda and Kuda. I joined you here uh, today, but if you'd like to stay, uh, you know, informed with regard to these conversations, follow our social media pages. That handle is Nastafim. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Alternatively, you can also uh, keep your eye on the research, innovation, and partnerships here at the Nast, uh, their social media pages as well. They are on Facebook and Instagram. All right, uh, Morgan did request for a song, and this song is Buffalo Soldiers.